Okay, real quick, I want to show this belly. See that? That's kind of scabby right where the umbilical cord was. Hey, you. Okay, now let me just put him away. Let me put this down for a minute. I gotta get him, have to get him on the heat because he needs to be warm. And I'll explain everything in a minute. Now, you see this. This is what he looked like two days ago. You see that? That could have easily led to death, and I've had it happen before. Um, this, that's the reason why I always cut all the cords. This particular time, I wasn't home because the puppies were born about four days early. And, I, and she just didn't, you know, she didn't show any signs of going into labor. And I went about my day, and I did a few things. I came home, and she had already had him. And she tugged at the belly. And, whoa, that light is making it. She tugged at the belly and made it to where, um, the, you know, it was kind of inf not really infected looking, but it, it was coming apart at the seams. Let's just put it that way. And what could have happened, instead of this infection, it could have ripped open and the insides could have started to come out. And if that would have happened, there's no turning back. The puppy would have died. So, because I've had that happen before. You have to put them down. I brought them to the vet. The vet said there's nothing you can do because they can't, a little two and a half ounce baby can't have surgery. They can't go under, it's just not possible. So, had to put puppies down when that happened in the past. I've learned to always cut my own cords. And we're gonna go about how I healed the infection and all that too, but this is what I use. This is why I'm always there for birth. I mean, except for the occasional time that happened here. Um, but I'm very hands-on. And if they don't eat their breakfast or they don't eat their dinner, I watch them like a hawk. And I also I don't go anywhere unless somebody's watching them. Um, but this, this time, she ate her breakfast. Everything was fine. And then she just started having puppies. When I wasn't home, I went to the store for like an hour and a half. But anyhow, when they have the puppies, you, I clamp them off, the hemostat, and you can use a flat one. This is a curved one. You don't have to have a curved one. But I clamp it off about a half an inch from the belly. You don't want to go too far away because if you go too far away, then the mom's going to have that opportunity more to like tug at it later on because they're bored. They're in there with their babies, and they get bored, and they do things. Um, so I go about a half an inch away. And then I use my fingernails and I just go like this because it's more like mother nature, except I'm not tugging as hard as mom. When mom tugs, she's like pulling like this sometimes and they can actually just pull the, the guts out of the puppy right then um, or make it to where they're vulnerable for it to happening later. Um, like in this case, it almost happened and this puppy's very lucky to be alive. So I, I pinch it all off more like mother nature. So it's not just a snap with the scissors because when you have a snap with the scissors if this thing falls off later on because what I do is I stick them on the heating pad the puppies with this attached and I leave it for like 45 minutes and then I take it off and sometimes this thing just falls off on its own and if the cut was too abrupt they can bleed to death or they can get close to bleeding to death. But if you catch it, I go in and I, I constantly go in and check and make sure in between delivering other puppies, I go, come back to the heating pad area and I um, double check to make sure this hasn't come off. Because if it has, then I can put bleed stop on and apply pressure and I've always stopped the bleeding. They've never, I've never had one bleed to death, but they can. Um, so that's the way I do that. And that's why my nails are always stained because I'm always doing stuff like this. Um, and I'm always uh, clipping off their, I use my nails to like just go clip and clip off their dew claws. And then I put bleed stop on it, but that's another story. Um, now, to heal this puppy, I use this. It's an antibiotic ointment. And I, I've been doing it for about, I don't know, three, two, three days now. And I've been um, putting it on about once every four or five hours. And... I've also been giving Clavamox. And when I use the Clavamox, I mix it up, you know, to, to the, uh, you know, 
because it comes in a powdered form, so I turn it into liquid liquid form. And then I put it in a 1cc syringe, and I literally just put less than a drop practically, because this little guy only weighs 2.5 ounces, so it's hard to dose. So I just put the smallest amount that I can get in him, and that's all you need. And you use that for respiratory infections as, as well. And now we're going to go to respiratory infections. He's an only child, and the reason he's an only child is because his brother... Um, I had to put him down when he was uh, two days old. And the reason I had to put him down was because sometimes, especially the little ones that are underdeveloped, they born, they're born early, their palates, it can be genetic as well, but this popped up out of nowhere. Um, so I don't really think it was genetic. But it's not like it's not a common thing. I've had it happen quite a few times. I've been doing this for 30 years, but I've had it happen quite a few times. And, um, and sorry, there's going to be no more really, uh, things in this video. So if you're bored, you turn it off, but if you are interested, keep going and I'm just going to talk about things. Um, but the cleft palates, if you have a puppy that's not thriving, especially a super, super tiny one, if you look back, it's, it doesn't always have to be way back in the roof of the mouth. Sometimes you just look in the roof of the mouth and it's not closed. That is the problem. And the brother had a huge cleft palate. Not really huge, but it was big enough to you could open his mouth and if you looked hard enough, you could see it. Um, you didn't need to like have a flashlight and really look down deep. But if you open the roof of the mouth and you don't see the cleft palate, you can take a flashlight and really look down and you can see at the base and what'll happen is they try to suck and they can't suck without it going up their nose. So that's why I had this because I noticed right away that both of them had a cleft palate, but the brother had a bigger one than this little guy. This little guy just barely had one. So I was using this to suck out because I was doing feedings only on my lap, holding mom down because I was worried that they would suck and then aspirate and I wouldn't have this to suck it out. So I was trying to save them that way. And I did save the, um, the little, the one who did survive. Um, he's not aspirating. He wasn't doing it much to begin with. Um, cause it was so small. And what happens is they learn when it's just slight, they kind of learn how to do it and they, it doesn't come up their nose and they survive. But when it's bigger, there's nothing you can do unless, unless you tube feed. And I'm not, I'm not tube feeding a two ounce little baby. I've killed too many, to be honest. And it's too horrible of a death. And I just, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not good at it. I admit it. I'm just not good at it. And in, um, so what I do is, I mean, if I, if I have to supplement tube feed and just tube feed every once in a while to get a little one going, that's one thing. But when you have a cleft palate situation and you have to tube feed every two, three hours and it goes, you know, to every four hours or so until they're able to eat on their own, that's, and drink on their own, that's a lot of tube feeding. And your chances of having a mistake is high when you're tube feeding to begin with. And even if you have experience like I do, I just, you know, you, you, you mess up. The smaller they are, the harder it is to do. Everything about it is hard. Um, the temperature, and then the temperature staying warm enough after you've gotten it warm enough. It has to stay warm enough because you don't, you know, if you're messing up and you're not getting the tube down the esophagus and it's going down the trachea, and you got to redo it. By the time you finally get it in there, you're thinking, is this, war is this milk warm enough? Because if it's too cold, that's going to kill them. So it's just, it's a lot, and I, I, I'd rather just have the humane shot given to them uh, at the vet and there's no crying, no nothing. And they just pass. It's just, to me, that's just, uh, that's just the way to do it. Now I have this poor little guy. He's all alone. He can't be with mommy. The reason he can't be with mommy is because she'll lick that wound wide open. So I don't know how, I've never had this happen before where they've survived. Normally they don't. Um, but I think he's going to. And I can't risk her licking that wound open because she's bored. She's in there alone with him and she's going to lick, lick, lick. And the reason they lick so much is because that's how they get their babies to go to the bathroom. First 10 days, babies can't go. You always wonder why dogs eat poop. That's one of the main reasons. They learn it from their moms. 
their moms lick them to stimulate them to get them to go potty. And when they're not with their moms, that means that the breeder has to do it. So what I do is I take them and I go to the, um, to the sink. I have the hot water, warm water running and I rub my finger. I just stimulate the area with my finger. And if, if I do it for more than like a minute and nothing happens, they always pee right away. That, that happens within seconds. They, they easily do that. But when you are rubbing and for like a minute and there's no poop, then they're probably not going to for now. Um, so that's what I got to do. And, you know, I'm dealing with this poor puppy. Not only is he an only child, but he also doesn't have his mom. He's a little orphan all by himself on the heating pad. And, you know, I hold him on my lap about every two, three hours around the clock on mama. I want to keep her milk going. And that's his food source. So I hold him on there and he's thriving. He's got a nice big belly. He's gaining weight. Um, but poor mama, she's trying to break in the room where he's at. When I, you know, when I leave the, the house, even to go outside for a little while and garden, I have to put her, put her up because she'll just scratch the door to death. Um, it's very traumatic dealing with the feelings involved here because these dogs have feelings and the thought of some of these puppy mills, the way they would probably be treating the infant, the pro just, you know, just letting them die, um, and not even putting them down, just letting them wither away, letting them have no feel. It's just, it's really heartbreaking. Um, but anyhow, if you are a breeder and you have any questions about this, please don't ask me. I I've re I did the video once and I didn't answer every question, so I redid it again because I wanted to answer all the questions in the video. And if I didn't, please don't ask me questions because I don't have the time to respond writing all these answers and I won't respond. Um, this is more of a forum about my puppies, but when I see the opportunity to teach somebody something, I go ahead and throw it, in, throw it in a video like that. But this isn't a, a breeding uh, channel. 